I have a confession to make. The organizer of this TED event asked me to come up here and shed some light on what to expect from the coming millennium. But the truth is, I failed. The truth is, I failed before I even begun. They probably thought that if they bring a PhD in physics who is also a tech entrepreneur, he should know something. But the opposite is true. And I'm not talking about what to expect from the year 2,563, no. I'm talking about what to expect from the lives of our own generation and that of our kids. Now, to explain why I failed, I'd like to take you on a journey to the far history of mankind. Imagine yourself in a cave, in a big, dark cave. And as you stand there in the cave, glazing through the darkness, all of a sudden you see someone right in front of you. This someone is a caveman. The next thing you're going to do is take your phone and show it to him because you want to show him what marvelous things this amazing device can do. How do you think he would react, the caveman? I'll tell you, he would not find it marvelous. In fact, I believe he's going to feel something far stronger. He's going to feel his legs trembling, his heart beating faster, and adrenaline pumping rapidly through his veins because this caveman is now scared of your phone. He's terrified. Now, why is that? It is surely not because his brain is not developed enough. No, it's not. It's because what you just showed him, your phone, is nothing but nothing like anything he ever saw. And more importantly, it's nothing he could even imagine or predict. Now, I want you to recall, I was asked to come up here on this stage and shed some light on what to expect from the coming millennium, right? But the truth is, I don't believe I can. I don't believe anyone can. Because these days, we're developing a technology that is likely to change the face of humankind in an unforeseeable way. That's right. We're developing a technology called quantum computing, which could change the world so much that asking me or anyone else to predict the future is meant to fail. Just like the caveman could have not predicted the reality that we live in today, that of phones, aircraft, the internet, computers, no matter how visionary he was. He's a caveman, right? Now, just to make it crystal clear between us, right? In this analogy, you guys, each and every one of you, are the caveman, and so am I. Now, you may be telling yourself, oh, well, he's talking about some evolution that will take some 50,000 years. Not, not my concern. But it is your concern. Because I'm not talking about an evolution, I'm talking about a revolution. And this revolution is either going to happen in your lifetime or in your children's. Now I know, I've made some uh, very bold statements, and it's only been a few minutes into this TED Talk. But if you bear with me, I will explain to you exactly why I am so confident saying those things. And I do believe you should know. You ought to know. Now to explain, Let's get back to your phone. Your phone has a huge memory made out of about 10 billion transistors. Now, raise your hand if you ever got a new phone thinking, ha, this time the memory is more than enough for me. And just a few months later, started, find yourself scrolling up and down looking for pictures and apps you can get rid of because there is no more memory, right? And believe it or not, your phone today has more than a million times the transistors we had on the Apollo 11 when it was sent to the moon about 50 years ago. Yes, computers have evolved incredibly in the last few decades, being the by far leading factor for technological progress of mankind. We've come a long way. But the question is, can we get more? Can we get much more? And the answer is, yes, we can, with quantum computers. Here's an example. Let's say I had today, a quantum computer with just 300 transistors. I'm sure you'll all agree with me that 300 is far, far less than the 10 billion you have on your phone right now, right? The question is, could I be storing a decent amount of pictures on that phone, on, on that quantum computer? The answer is yes. Here's a surprise for you. I could store on that phone, on, on that quantum computer, more pictures than you can store on your phone today even if your phone had not 10 billion transistors, but, hear me well, more transistors than the number of atoms in the universe. I repeat, <laughs> a quantum computer with just 300 transistors could store more data than a normal computer, even if it, if it had more transistors than the number of atoms in the universe. 
Now, this is, of course, immense. And you are right to think that there must be something fundamentally different about it that makes it so potentially powerful. And I want to explain that to you because I think you should understand it. I want to explain the difference between quantum computers and, cl and normal computers through a very simple analogy. The analogy to the difference between multiplication of numbers and addition of numbers. This is primary school material, too easy for you. How many of you ever wanted to pick up a six-pack of mineral water? I'm sure most of you, and I'm sure you succeeded with great ease. How many of you ever wanted to, say, pick up a sofa and move it from one room to the next? Right? I'm sure many of you as well. And I'm sure you succeeded, but not without a friend's help, because for that you need two people. How many of you ever had your car broken down and had to move it around? In that case, I'm pretty sure you did not move it around manually by hand, because you would need some 45 strong men to lift up a car. Okay, I'm not talking about lifting up it up slightly above the floor. I'm, I'm talking about lifting it up, moving around. Okay. Now the thing is, the thing is, the average man can strong can can lift up about 40 kilograms. Okay. So if I need to lift up something and I need help, then for every man joining me, I add. This is addition of numbers. I add 40 kilograms. So someone joins plus 40. Someone joins plus 40 plus 40, and so on and so forth. But now let's imagine something different. Let's imagine that for every man joining me, I don't add 40, but I double my lifting capacity. Let's think about it. It's, it's, a good, it's an interesting example. Let's think about this scenario. For the six pack of mineral water, it's the same. It's easy. You just pick it up, no problem. For the sofa, you pick it up as well with one, with, with one additional person. Two people pick it up, no problem. What about the car? Here's a surprise. In this scenario, in order to lift up the car, you would need only six people. Six people lift up the car. And as the seventh man joins you, you can now lift up two cars, because it doubles. Six people, one car. Seven people, two cars, it doubles. And with 83 people only, you would be able to lift up the entire, listen carefully, Earth. The entire Earth, putting gravity aside for a moment, okay? Now, this is an interesting example. I want you to think about it. Because I did not describe to you a scenario in which it would be easier to lift up the earth. You would need less people. No. I described a scenario in which you would take the impossible task of lifting up the earth and make it possible. It's a big difference. Now, the bad news for you guys is that most things you use on a daily basis work like the addition of numbers. Your phone, for example, works that way too. Okay? If you have a phone with 10 billion transistors, and now you want to store twice the pictures, you need 20 billion transistors. Okay? So why don't you get another phone? You have two phones, right? but it's not, it's not so cool. What if we could build computers that, with every transistor added, the capacity doubled, like the multiplication example we just had? We can. Quantum computers. In quantum computers, with every transistor added, the capacity doubles, therefore growing the power at an incredible pace. This is why, for example, with a full-scale quantum computer, I could crack pretty much any encryption protocol on the internet. Bank computers, government computers, your phone, your Facebook account, within minutes. This is well established. This is something that would take the biggest computer we now have on Earth hundreds of thousands of years. And this is another good example, because this is taking something that would take hundreds of thousands of years, running in minutes. Impossible to possible. And you may be asking yourself, Where's the, what's the magic? Why does it work that way? But if you think about it for a moment, even the computers we have today seem like magic, right? They seem weird. I mean, just the thought of a wireless keyboard sending letters through the air to a computer that then displays it, them on a screen, right? It's, it's magic. It's weird. But as weird as it is, it can be explained by the simplest laws of nature as we know them since the 19th century, such as electricity and magnetism. But quantum computers are fundamentally different. They are based on different laws of nature, the laws of quantum mechanics. And if you thought sending letters through the air is weird, 
then guys, you should hold on tight. Because in, in the quantum world, which is our world, by the way, everything you know breaks. In the quantum world, for example, things can be in multiple places at the same time. And objects far apart, galaxies away, can affect one another instantaneously. Sounds like science fiction? Well, I surely agree. But since I'm a geek, I've been dedicating my, my, my entire adulthood until this very day to making this a reality. And I'm not alone. Governments, funds, and corporates all over the world are investing billions of dollars to the race to being among the first ones to put their hands on this incredible technology. Now, don't get me wrong. Building quantum computers is not going to be a walk in the park. In fact, it's probably one of the biggest challenges that our biggest brains are working on these days. Moreover, there are even open questions and serious doubts, even by experts. Will it take three years or 30? But rest assured, we're on it. Quantum computers are coming, and there is no way back. Now, with this confidence that I'm displaying here, how come I said in the beginning that I failed in the task given to me by the organizers to shed some light on what to expect from the coming millennium, right? Because I could be standing up here on this stage and saying that, for example, quantum computers could allow us to develop vaccines and drugs for uh, pandemics in a matter of days. Many believe so. That they could allow us to develop um, new, cheap sources of energy to fuel the entire planet. Many believe so that quantum computers could allow us to develop artificial intelligence that would place our own perception of what human is to question. But I'm not doing that. Because if I did so, it means I did not comprehend the potential power of these machines. Because, you see, the potential of these machines is unpredictable. Just like the caveman could have not foreseen the future that we live in, that of computers, phones, aircrafts, and the internet, we cannot predict the future of quantum. You see, because all of these examples that I just gave you, if you close your eyes for just a moment, you could imagine, you could predict. But the future of quantum is not a predictable one. Now, as we progress towards an unpredictable future, I believe that our duty above all is to reflect. How do we prepare? How do we prepare? And with this talk, I'd like to encourage you to think, to think deeply about that. Because as we go towards an expedition to an unknown land, we do not equip ourselves with specific tools, but rather we work on our mindset. We prepare to be flexible, to think out of the box. Now, I'm not sure about you guys. As for me, I'm going to be spending my days teaching that my own kids. I hope you too. Thank you.